You know, we're living in a society. But they want to deliver vast amounts of information over the internet. It's, it's a series of tubes. We're supposed to act in a civilized way. Allison, can you explain what internet is? Welcome. <laughs> Hello you guys, welcome back. I am so sorry for the unintentionally extended break from episodes. I really didn't mean for that to happen, but um, a lot has been going on, including being a little bit sick, as you might be able to tell uh, in my voice. I have been sick for a couple weeks. I'm not sure if it's the same sick that's going around the whole world right now. I haven't actually been tested, but if it is, it's not so bad for me because I'm still kicking. I really appreciate those of you who emailed me to check in and make sure I'm not dead. Still not dead. Still standing. <laughs> but those emails make me feel loved. So I appreciate it. I feel like we lived in a different world the last time I uploaded an episode just a couple months ago. And I hope everyone out there is doing okay. I got a little bit of an update for you. Before we get into this, I'm actually going to be making a YouTube version of Indirect Message now, which is part of what took me so long, but not all of what took me so long. I have found myself missing YouTube. And so now I'm going to make two versions of each episode, a short sort of Cliff Notes version on YouTube and a longer extended cut version here on the podcast. So whether you're the type of person that wants it quick and dirty or slow and meandering, hopefully this covers our bases. I also want to apologize in advance for a few little audio issues that came up um, with my guest this episode. You know, I may have to like start shipping back and forth a microphone to people because the laptop microphones, uh, it's hit and miss, you know, or maybe I'm just really extra. All right, let's get into today's topic, which is kind of morbid, but also not. It's funny, I started thinking about this before the pandemic even started, and now I guess it's even more relevant than it was before. I think that all of us ponder at some point or another whether or not we're afraid to die. I like to tell myself that death will bring sweet relief, and so it's nothing to be afraid of, but deep down, I'm not sure I actually believe that. In fact, it's probably just the depression talking. In reality, I do have some anxiety about dying, and I think most people do, though we push it down to varying degrees. There is actually a ton of research out there that finds that our fear of death motivates our behavior in a lot of weird ways. It can influence everything. Uh, you know, from romantic relationships all the way up to national politics. Does anyone remember the button? In 2015, a mysterious button appears on Reddit. It has a countdown clock that's set to 60 seconds, and the only explanation we got was you can only press the button once. So users start flooding the subreddit and using their click, and every time someone presses the button, it resets to 60 seconds. But once you take your turn, your account is forever branded with a color-coded flare showing how quickly you press the button. And interestingly, these digital tribes start forming around the colors. You know, you've got the Emerald Council, the Red Guard. But in all this hubbub, there's one big question unanswered. What the f*** is the button? What does it mean? And what What's gonna happen when the clock runs out? It's a month in, and people start losing their minds. You know, one user writes, There's not much time left, guys. With strong discipline, the knights may be able to hold back the clock for a couple of days. I really don't want to know what's gonna happen when the button stops. I'd rather be in hell. And then it happens. Two months in, over a million clicks later, the clock runs out. The mods give people 10 minutes to lead their final words. I feel nothing. What the hell am I going to watch in the bathroom now? Who is the Prasaya? We need to know. What was the point? Where is our closure? And on that day, poor wannabe groundhog realized there would be no closure. You see, the button never meant anything at all. It was just randomness, chaos. It meant something because we collectively decided that it meant something. And all of our fears and anxieties about the clock running out were ultimately moot because it was gonna run out and there was nothing that we could do about it. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I think that the button is this perfect weird little microcosm 
of terror management theory. My guest today is Dr. Jeff Greenberg. He's a social psychologist who coined terror management theory. He had a lot to share about how fear of death plays out in our lives and in society. All the ways that we psychologically attempt to live forever and how to rein in some of that existential terror. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Terror management theory is a theory about uh, essentially why we behave the way we do, why we strive for the goals we do, uh, and how we function well in the world with our anxieties relatively minimized. And the theory starts with the very simple idea that we're a species of animal, and like other animals, we're biologically predisposed in many ways to keep living. But unlike other animals, we have this uh, you know, well-developed cerebral cortex that allows us to understand the future and understand that we're creatures within this reality and that eventually we're going to die. And so the theory argues that, uh, that there's an underlying potential for terror due to this realization that other animals are spared. So we have this burden of the knowledge of our mortality that we carry with us, that you know, dawns on us over the course of childhood, and that we wouldn't be able to function with sort of a full acceptance that we're just these vulnerable creatures that are going to die happen for all sorts of reasons, could happen without, you know, can't be predicted, and that no matter what we do, it's going to happen. That's potentially terrifying. And so what the theory argues is we have to in some way deny that. And the way we do it is by being socialized into cultural worldviews that give us a sense that we will continue on beyond our physical death, either literally through soul and afterlife beliefs, or symbolically through our identity, through our children, through our accomplishments, and the things that we achieve in the world. So our culture, the way we come to view the world, offers us some kind of primitive sense of security. Um, so what happens when our worldview is challenged or threatened in some way? If we lose faith in our worldview, then that security that the worldview provides is undermined, and we might be faced with just these creatures, vulnerable creatures that are going to die. So we have to sustain faith in our worldview at all costs. Let's say um, someone from Iran has a very different worldview. Me knowing that they don't believe, don't value the things that I value is potentially threatening because it's suggesting to me that maybe my worldview is wrong. But my worldview is my basis of psychological security. So I can't have that. And so Becker argued that a lot of uh, a lot of problems that cultures have getting along come down to different worldviews and different sort of security bases that are that are at odds with each other. Do you think that this relates to some of the division that we've seen in the United States in the past decade, but really the past few decades as Americans become more polarized? Uh, yes. Yeah, it is. Because, I mean, everybody's worldview is actually different, right? We're all individuals. So it's always your own individual understanding of what your parents taught you, what your teachers taught you, how you learn about the world and about American history and science and all that. So we all, so for example, all Americans, you know, would believe in freedom, but we still, you know, have different worldviews. And some of that has more and more come down to the liberal versus the conservative worldview. Probably take us, you know, a little bit off topic, but if, if you have, uh, you know, if you believe in a liberal worldview, then a lot of your self-worth is tied up in trying to support social justice, trying to improve the, the situation for minority groups and low SES people. Uh, the conservative worldview is, is a little more about loyalty to the group and making sure America is strong. And what the theory would argue is the more the threat of death is sort of in people's minds, the more we tend to grab on tightly to our own worldview. And so in scary times, you're going to see more polarization. Uh, if we go back a ways to kind of maybe the last major, you know, national crisis was 9-11. At the beginning, everybody kind of drew together. We're all Americans. This was an attack on America. We tried to strengthen America. Everybody was kind of on board with that. And that lasted for a while. But sort of the lingering threat 
of terrorism that has obviously continued way beyond that, I think has led instead of a unification, more of a polarization between these two, you know, political uh, views of the world. We also make an argument that there are different, two different basic types of worldviews. We call it the rock and the hard place, that there's a rock kind of worldview and a hard place worldview. The rock kind of worldview is more like the politically conservative worldview. It's a worldview where there's a very clear sense of good and bad, right and wrong, and uh, it, it's very clear how to be, how, how you should be a good person, how to sort of feel like you're heroically contributing to a, a triumph over evil. And, and the main negative emotion is sort of anger. That's more of a conservative worldview. And it fits with a lot of any kind of fundamentalist worldview is like that. So a fundamentalist Islamic worldview is also a very rock kind of worldview. It's very clear, good and bad, right and wrong is very clear. And it's very clear the paths to being significant and contributing to the world. The hard place worldview is one that you see the world more complexly. You're more kind of willing to acknowledge that other worldviews have truth to them and ours isn't necessarily the absolute truth. You question even your own values at times, but you're not so sure how, you know, what to do uh, to be a good person. It's not as, as simple. And so it's a worldview where the primary negative motion is more is anxiety. And one of the things we found in our research is if you remind people of their mortality, they tend to be drawn t- toward politicians who sell us more of a rock type of worldview, more of a simple, we're good, there's evil out there, we have to defeat the evil kind of worldview. So It seems to suggest that some people, uh, maybe people who are drawn toward more conservative leaders and uh, conservative uh, policies are maybe having more anxiety about death. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would say that, that they uh, are more focused on, in a sense, using their political beliefs as a way to quell their anxieties about death, because their identification with America is part of the way they feel invulnerable, in a sense. And I think liberals identify a little bit less, and we've shown this empirically, they, they, they identify less strongly with their nationality. They're less, they're less sort of invested in nationalism. And so their, their ways of coping with the fear of death is a little more individualized, a little bit more trying to accomplish things in their own lives, a little more personalized rather than through national identity. What role does religious belief play in all of this? Because they give us the possibility of literal immortality as well as symbolic immortality. People argue about Judaism, but uh, certainly in, in, in Hinduism, in Islam, Christianity, in small tribal spiritual belief systems, there's a belief in afterlife. And if you can believe in an afterlife, then that, of course, provides the greatest security. Now, religions have, you know, religions have their own issues, and religions have specific aspects to them that, that might be problematic. Some people demonize religion. I think that's a mistake because worldviews get us into trouble. Worldviews get us into trouble because they tell us we're good and then some other group is bad. So the the danger of a worldview is kind of wrapped up in how dogmatic it is, not yes. necessarily what the beliefs are. Right, right. That's a beautiful, simple way to, to say it, yes. That's interesting. Um, so religion could maybe have some protective effect here uh, against the fear of death. Um, some of your other research looks at how self-esteem can add some protection as well. So how can we build self-esteem? If you're somebody who feels like you're not a meaningful person in the world and feels like you're not able to offer anything valuable to your community or society, what are some of the ways under this particular theory of the world that people could have better self-esteem? Well, there's two problems that could lead to to not feeling self-esteem. One is not having a meaningful worldview that you believe in. So there are some people who uh, have lost their sense that there's any meaning to the world. So for people like that, you know, you, you would want them to hopefully find something, some meaningful worldview. If it was in a psychotherapy context, then the psychotherapist would have to not give them a worldview, but would say, here's some options of ways of thinking about the world as meaningful uh, and try to help them realize that there, that, that, that there is meaning in the world, even if you have to, in a sense, create it. 
uh, one can do that. And, and obviously the existential philosophers talk a lot about that, people like Camus and Sartre, those sorts of folks. Um, but if a person does have a meaningful worldview, then they have to find pathways within that worldview to feel like they're contributing to that meaningful world. Uh, and yes, people some, often suffer from self-esteem because they don't feel like they're doing that. Now, they might not be doing that because they're striving for things that don't really suit them, right? So I would argue that you know, everybody can contribute positively to the world, but you have to find your way, right? So you might have somebody who grew up in a family where let's say the parents were doctors and they grew up thinking, I have to be a doctor to be of value to the world. So they might find themselves, you know, beating their head against the wall, I've got to be a doctor, got to be a doctor, and yet, you know, they're blowing it, right? They can't, they can't get past that organic chem course or whatever. Uh, so for that kind of person, what you have to do is broaden their view of how to be meaningful and valuable in the world and say, hey, look, you don't have to be a doctor. That's one way to be of value. But there's many other ways. And then so you have to open, it, open them up to other alternative ways that they can contribute in a positive way to the world that will have, you know, lasting mark in the world. So everybody has that potential in them, but some people are kind of caught in their own heads with here's how I have to be of value. And if that doesn't work, then I've got nothing. So maybe one of the ways to deal with our existential terror is to open our minds about what it means to be a valuable contributor to society and help people find their place? Absolutely, absolutely. And if you look at it, I think that one of the problems in the modern world is in some ways too many choices. Uh -huh. Hundreds of years ago, your parents brought you up and said, okay, this is how you be value in, of value in the world, right? Uh, and it might be, you know, well, I'm a baker and you're gonna inherit my bake shop and you're gonna be a baker and you're gonna be value to your community, right? Because back then, you know, you'd be the only baker in the village the person who cook, bakes the bread, that's a really valuable person. Now we live in larger societies where there's so many options that I think a lot of, a lot of young people are, you know, are having trouble picking one way. And one of the things that I, you know, I've talked to a lot of students, and one of, the, one of the problems students have is they don't want to pick one way. You know, it's, like, it's like, well, that shuts off all these other ways, but you have to. At some point, you got to make a decision whether you're going to be you know, a great uh, YouTube journalist or a uh, or a social psychologist, or a lawyer, or a, you know, a construction worker who builds buildings. I mean, there's lots of ways to potentially, you know, be of value to society, and you got to pick one. But here's another problem. Another problem is, in a large culture like ours, certain roles, many roles have to be filled. Right? We need sanitation workers, for example. Right? Imagine if all the sanitation workers said, "No, nope, not doing that." Right? We'd have huge problems very quickly. So they're of value, but the society assigns greater value to certain roles than others. The way that we are rewarded or valued in society based on income is not necessarily proportional to the amount of value that we can bring to people's lives. That seems like it could create some um, resentment or uh, low self-worth. I just feel like that has come up quite a bit lately with people realizing how important, you know, the people who work at the supermarket are. Yes, yes, absolutely. But, and, and unfortunately, our, you know, the capitalist culture that we live in, it's sort, of a, it's sort of a pyramid, right? You got your billionaires at the top, and then it kind of, you know, you go down from there. And when you're only paying somebody 12 bucks or 15 bucks an hour, uh, in a sense, the society's not telling them that what they're doing is of great value. And it also means that they can't provide as well for their kids, for their family. So I think it's, it's difficult. And Becker actually made this point that, that in a small tribal culture of like 200 people, everybody's of value. You can see it like every day. In a culture of 300 million people, it's hard to, to sustain a sense of value. In, in some extent to whoever you are, but especially if you're doing things that a lot of people are doing. You know, so, so back hundreds of years ago, if you were a baker, you might, you're probably the only baker in town. Now, if you're a baker at Safeway, you know, you should feel good about what you're doing. You're helping to feed people, but you also know how much you're getting paid. And you know that there's also thousands of other bakers. You know, if you're a baker and you don't have a baking TV show on the Food Network, then the society isn't, you know, kind of reinforcing and validating 
mm-hmm. your worth day to day. Now we can do it as individuals. You can you can be thankful when you go you go and get something from from the grocery store. You can you can thank the person for for their efforts and stuff. That gives them a little bit. But you know if it's not backed up by money, we got to face it that that money is in some ways what the society is telling you. Uh, your your efforts are worth and that sort of effort. So if you're, yeah, I mean, yeah, my dad was a construction worker. He worked very hard. He came home super super tired every day. Worked outside all the time. You know, most of his sense of value was in providing for us kids and telling us that we're going to have a better life than he did. And that was a big part of his sense of self worth. So a lot of people get their sense of worth from their their love relationships, from their romantic relationship, from their kids, and from providing. For their kids. I wanted to ask you about technology as well. Um, obviously, technology okay. is making it possible for us to live longer lives, and futurists like to imagine the world where we can live forever. Um, right. Do you think that this could potentially alleviate some of our fears of death? Well, I think that, that there are scientists who are working to extend life and to sort of try to slow up, if not reverse, the aging process. And I think that that is one way to try and deal with, with death and say, well, if we could just not die. But a lot of people think that that's not going to work because if people don't die, then what are we going to, you know, then we're going to get overpopulated very, very quickly. And of course the first people who won't, who will, who will live indefinitely will be rich people mm-hmm. and then poor people will want that technology. And so there's lots of issues with that, but I understand the impulse to want to extend life. Absolutely. But the, the other ways, and you see this in shows like black mirror and stuff is, Oh, we're going to take you and we're going to put you on the internet, right? Lacey, you're already on the internet, right? Uh, but we're going to make sure you're there permanently. We're going to take oh, God. your we're going to take your consciousness and your personality, and you know, Lacey Green is going to forever exist in the in the cyber in the cyber world. That I would argue is nonsense. But that idea is just another version of soul belief. Your body's part of who you are. My body's part of who I am. And you can't separate your frontal lobes from your limbic system. And Mm -hmm. your limbic system is connected to your body. Soul seems like a strong word um, in terms of what the internet can capture. I think of it as sort of an echo of myself that I'm putting online. It's not really me because it's these very small recorded tidbits of me. Um, There's no evolution. There's no learning of the me in the video, you know, and this is actually something that has frequently frustrated me in the YouTube world because my 17 year old self lives on just as presently as my 30 year old self online. I get to be every single age on the Internet. That's that's right. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like some people do see their YouTube videos and the things they share on social media as as a way to kind of preserve part of themselves. But what you're saying is a little bit different, right? Absolutely. You know, so a YouTube video that stays after you die is, is the same thing as a book that I write that's still in a library after I die. It's not liter- it's not literal immortality, but it is it's a and it's it's fine as a basis for symbolic immortality. And it also I think this is an interesting lens for understanding people's drive to get get a lot of um, recognition online. I think that that's that can be positive that making content online, you know, if you feel like it is a part of yourself and it's a way to make an impact can be great. I also see it go in some unhealthy ways, uh, similar to religious belief, right? Where you invest too much in maybe some unhealthy beliefs or behaviors that you need to do X, Y, Z to be valuable. You need to get a million views or, you know, whatever it might be in order to have your digital uh, person be significant or, or valuable. Right. It becomes too rigid, too concrete. And then, yeah, I've heard that, that, that kids now, you know, 10 year olds are like, how many likes do I have on my Instagram? And they, they get the pre- they get the press that they don't get enough likes in a given day. I, I kind of want to pivot here and talk a little bit about whether we can really overcome this fear that we have. Um, and if we should overcome the fear of death to begin with. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. Uh, first of all, Becker argued based on some other people and, and, and some research that, that basically we can't, we can't fully get rid of it, that, mm-hmm. that it, that it's functional. It's adaptive. 
and, and Darwin made this point as well, that it's adaptive to have fear, right? Yeah. Because fear, fear helps to keep us alive. And so our limbic system is set up to, for fight or flight, right? And, uh, and that's functional. And so we have to have that. And, you know, the, the problem with us humans is uh, that limbic system that, that kicks in when we're in imminent danger, right? And says, well, I don't want to die, right? And so you, you run away or you fight, whatever you need to do to survive. Uh, our, our frontal lobes are telling us, whoa, what about that lump that's on your neck? What, what could that be? So we have this great capacity to kind of feel terror even when there's no imminent threat. And that's where the worldviews and the self-worth and the symbolic reality that we live within helps to quell all of that. But some people have argued that if we could somehow, in a sense, mature beyond our fear of death, if we could come to terms with it, then we would function in a better way. We wouldn't have to rely so much on our own beliefs so that we have to reject somebody else's beliefs. And, you know, people also argue the awareness of our mortality can help us appreciate life. The fact that you know that it's temporary can lead you to stop and, you know, smell the roses, really appreciate the time that you do have. And there's some, there's some truth that others, there's, there's other cliches like seize the day, right? Carpe diem, you know, live, live, the, live this day as if it's your last. And that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> we're future oriented beings that's how we survive right if you told me this is my if i if i should act like this is the last day on earth i'm going to get like six cartons of chocolate ice cream and buy a jaguar and drive around it'd be great the problem is i'd wake up tomorrow and i'd have no money and i'd be fatter <laughs> and so there's research showing that as as we get older that, that elderly folks actually are a little better about appreciating life day to day as long as they're healthy a little better about appreciating life day to day and max sort of like optimizing their positive emotion, minimizing their negative emotions and optimizing being around the people they really care about and doing the things that they really value. You know, one of the things that is touted a lot is the importance of meditation, um, making a gratitude journal, things like this. Um, I see all over the internet as ways to kind of keep a more positive frame of mind and, and to, um, yeah, just have more appreciation for all the great things that are in our lives and the fact that we even are alive. I feel like I got a little bit of this from reading, reading Ernest Becker and, and kind of delving into these ideas that when you, you kind of force yourself a little bit to think about immortality, that, you know, there's some anxiety that goes with that. But anxiety is not always a bad thing either, right? I mean, anxiety kind of keeps us going. Uh, but I think along with that, a little bit more anxiety, yeah, I think you can get more, a little more appreciation of life. And gratitude journals are a way to remind yourself, certainly, to be grateful for the things you have in your life. Um, I also think that when you, when you think about your mortality, and also think about these ideas that we call terror management theory, it helps you recognize that you've got a path and hopefully it's working for you but other people have a different paths and they're trying to do the same thing you're trying to do mm -hmm. just in a different way. And mm -hmm. so I think that it can help you not only be compassionate to yourself, but be, be compassionate to others, even if they're pursuing a path that you don't understand. Ah, that last quote there, it can help us to be compassionate to others, even if they're pursuing a path that we don't understand. Working on the sound. Thanks for rejoining me, you guys. Have a great weekend, and I'll be back in a couple weeks.